Let's say good morning to our guests in this segment. A familiar face, Alonzo Perry, president of the Berkeley County Republican Club, frequent contributor to the Friday program. Good morning, Alonzo. Good morning. It's nice to have, or thanks for having us. Thanks for being here. You know, uh, I'm really excited to talk to you guys today. You're kind of out of your element as a guest. You're not used to being interviewed. <laughs> I, yeah, no, this is definitely strange. Uh, the radon test kits are not in my name. It's just, uh, <laughs> they are, they're in my name, buddy. Yeah. <laughs> today they're in my name. <laughs> He's got a bigger budget than you. Yeah, no, I can understand that. I can yeah. understand that he's a free, you know, uh, a frequent contributor. But no, so the first thing that we really wanted to talk about today was our um, our Lincoln dinner. So now, before you do that, there's a smiling face to your left. Oh, I Chris probably. Turner, your vice president. <laughs> so yeah, I want to introduce my vice president, uh, Chris Turner. He's my right hand man, and make sure that you know everything that I do is legitimate. And he kind of is is the wisdom. I guess in our camp, uh, in our administration of our club. So, but vice presidents are usually better seen and not heard. <laughs> <laughs> well, Chris, good morning. Thanks for coming in. Thank you. Uh, and Alonzo, now you can launch into the Lincoln Day dinner. So the first thing, the big thing I want to talk about is we are hosting a Lincoln dinner, and this is uh, unprecedented because we're actually going to be uh, joining up with Jefferson County Executive Committee, and so both of our counties are going to come together to host this big dinner and um on april 30th we'll have congressman alex mooney uh treasurer riley moore attorney general morrissey and the secretary of state mac warner come out and just speak to the groups and there's also an opportunity for people that um are business leaders in the community and want to help the republican club and and some of our organizations um they can sponsor the event. And we have multiple sponsorship opportunities for people to be able to contribute and also get you know their shout out and their due diligence at our event. Um, there was, uh, uh, first and foremost, how do you get tickets before I go into some of my questions? So our tickets will be sold on um, berkeleycountygop.com. That's berkeleycountygop.com. And if you hit the Lincoln Dinner tickets, there's also the sponsorship opportunities there available. So you can just click right there and we'll get you set up to where you're able to communicate with us and uh, set up. And this is really unprecedented because um, two counties haven't merged before, I guess, in the area. This is something new that we wanted to do. So you're really getting two counties for one in your advertising, being able to talk to or, you know, a, a large swath of people in not only Berkeley, but Jefferson County as well. So now you guys keep on your GOP hats here for a second, because uh, one, I'm told that Patrick Morrissey, the attorney general, is expected today to announce that he will run for either governor or senator. I don't know what time. I just know that announcement's coming today. We have him on the program tomorrow morning. Metro News released some information today, and uh, you can read it there. And potential head-to-head -head matchup with Alex Mooney and Governor Jim Justice uh, in a race for the uh, Senate seat would receive 55% of the vote, Mooney getting 24%, 21% undecided. If you throw Patrick Morrissey's name into that mix, Justice Mooney Morrissey, in that race, Justice gets 43%, Morrissey 21 Mooney 10%. Okay? So tell me what you make of those numbers, Alonzo, Chris, in regards to a two-way or three-way primary for Senate. Well, I think that... There's other names in there, too, by the way, but those are the three big hitter names. Well, uh, I, I don't foresee uh, Patrick Morsey running for the Senate seat uh, at first. And we also know polls are you know, definitely a contentious uh, topic to, to say whether or not if they're how accurate they are. But I do think that, you know, the poll alludes to something that I think would kind of happen if Morsey were to jump in that race. And I think Alex Mooney and Patrick Morsey would split the vote a little bit and would give uh, Governor Justice the runaway with that election if that were the case. Um, we don't endorse people in the Berkeley sure. County Republicans Club, but um, I, I, I would foresee that the conditions that are being set is for Patrick Morsey to run for governor. It's more likely. And then having Alex Mooney and Governor Justice to run against each other in the Senate race. And it's only from foreshadowing from his own account. He said, I'm going to travel to the, you know all 55 counties. And I mean, that's kind of you know alluding more towards, I'm going to be your governor, mm -hmm. you know? I agree with you. I think Morrissey will declare for governor, not, not Senate. Chris, what do you think? Well, the, the one thing I want to say is uh, Governor Justice has name recognition. 
where he covers the whole state and everybody in the state knows him. Um, and literally, the poll showed 100% name recognition. recognition. Yep. And everybody else is, is starting behind. So they have mm -hmm. to get their names out there. Um, Mooney is well known, but not at, not at that level. So, and uh, he only covers half the state. So, mm -hmm. you know, let's let's hope that uh, there's more name recognition coming. Um, you know, anything's better than what's in there right now. Let's the, put it that way. The polls showed that 100% of people recognized Jim Justice's name, and 77% had a favorable favorable opinion mm -hmm. of Governor Justice, which I thought was pretty impressive. Uh, you know, considering I don't know how those numbers are in the Eastern Panhandle, I suspect they're a little less. Yeah. Uh, but uh, statewide, seventy-seven percent is pretty amazing. We talked about this before. I think Governor Justice has that X factor. There's a likability factor in Governor Justice mm -hmm. that comes right through the camera. Yeah. You know, you, you just you you like him. How do you not like him? <laughs> I want to say. Go ahead. I was going to say, he's the guy you'd like to sit next to and, and have a beer. Yeah. So. Yeah. I mean, outside of politics, you know, if yeah. you, it, it's just, and I think that's that's not a little thing when it comes to, to elections. I think he's met a lot of people, too, you know, and that's uh, going to be the hurdle that I think Alex Mooney's really going to have to pay attention to is that, you know, he's going to have to be in people's faces. He's going to have to meet them, shake their hands, you know, and be in those areas where he feels like, you know, uh, he may not be pulling well. But he's also got an extremely positive record. And I don't think justice can compete when it comes to, you know, how they voted, what they voted on. And if you look at, you know, the policy implications of who we put in our Senate seat, and um, uh, that could be something that swings, you know, the election towards Alex Mooney, or that could be, you know, like you said, there's a, a personality thing that could be mm -hmm. just overwhelming in the sense for justice to be able to take the race. So uh, who knows how this is going to turn out? I think that um, there's definitely a lot of uh, different angles to look at this and to see, you know, um, what what each campaign brings to the forefront that um, really kind of guides their light. I know one thing about Alex and campaigning, and he'll have every thing about Jim Justice that is not conservative. <laughs> yeah, on in out in public and forefront and in ads and mailers, and, and he's going to pick on that and beat on that. And by the time that election day rolls around, you're going to know every conservative imperfection about Jim Justice. Oh, most definitely. I think that uh, Alex Mooney is a skillful campaigner. I also think that you know that goes to show that uh, he also has a record to back up. You know what he says. You know he's he's going to go down into the Senate and he's going to vote in a way that I feel like West Virginians would champion, you know, and not only that, but I've saw him bring up, you know, this return to the gold standard. And I think that there is this thirst right now in this country to uh, have a sound currency. I think that there's policy implications that are happening, you know, internationally that are, are making people feel uneasy, that are paying attention to some of the developments that are taking place across the world with Brazil and, uh, you know, China wanting to you know, remove the U.S. dollar for their trade of, of petrol. I mean, you know, if that keeps cascading and that keeps happening until all large energy producers in this country start to move away from the U.S. dollar, I mean, that significantly hits our fiat currency. And so um, unless we have something, a, a plan or some type of, of way to really round about how we're going to fix some of the issues uh, related to our currency, we're probably not looking too good here in the next 20, 30 years down the line. And so um, that was something that I saw his campaign talked about that really stuck out to me. And I hope that, you know, um, that's something that West Virginians are informed on for sure. Matt Miller. I'm just sitting here thinking that it's it's almost the uh, I, I hate to bring the term up, but I, I will, that like a Trump factor when you look at Governor Justice in this regard. He is so well liked in the southern part of the state that the challenge for Mooney is you put that record out, and I think there are a lot of people in the southern part of the state that are going to be, don't be beating up my governor, as yeah. opposed to looking at it and going, well, he does make some good points. They're going to look at it more like that's a cheap shot. And so uh, it's a real fine line. I mean, he's got a tough battle ahead if, if that turns out to be, you know, the, the battle that does take place. Yeah, so. most definitely. And I, I want to know, too, you know, what is Governor Justice going to bring? You know, what is mm -hmm. what it, tell us, you know, we sure we know who you are. We know you have a cool dog, you know, uh, 
<laughs> we we enjoy that. But I mean, what are you really going to bring to the table that that you know West Virginians can be excited about? Yeah. If you do take this you know seat, I mean, you are now one of one hundred you know <laughs> representing us on a federal scale, and we want to know you know uh, what are you going to offer in that body that's going to you know. Uh, leave us better off. Yeah, this is a totally different role. You're you're not the guy now that that can kind of call all of the shots. How well will he fit into that role compared to being the governor is a big question too. Mm -hmm. Well, if I can counsel the Mooney campaign because I know he's listening to everything that, that I think on these things. He was he was on the show last week, I think, and I pressed him pretty hard to offer up some plans for the future. And he seems locked into talking about his conservative record and about, you know, the, the holding the Biden administration accountable for things and all that. All of that is looking in the past. This is what my record was. People, I think, need to start talking about what I want to do next. If I'm elected, it's not just that I think the right way. It's that I have attractive plans and this is what they are. And I haven't heard that from anybody, actually. I, I, I could I could see that in the the Senate race, but uh, once again, I, I've I've seen his you know plan on the gold standard. I think what's kind of crazy when we talk about federal elections is just the the scale. You know, I mean, the 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 things that you're voting on and the the issues that you have to face. You know, uh, I feel like as conservatives we are mainly trying to stop the train from running off the tracks. And so I think that's why it's been pretty hard for uh, conservatives across the country to really have a message that is appealing to, you know, your, your general independence and, and uh, politically homeless individuals that are um, don't really feel like, you know, either party is representing their interests but, right now. But don't do and, this rings hollow if there's not a do this instead. I mean, that's and that's true. I think that uh, as conservatives uh, across the country, I think we do need to find, you know, those issues that uh, we feel like people care about. We need to have uh, solutions and, and plans that, you know, uh, people can get behind because I, you have to understand as a conservative, you're also operating under a constrained view of the world. You know, you're not in the unconstrained, whereas, uh, you know, our friends on the other side of the aisle, they don't care how much it costs. They don't care at what, you know, uh, what is the further implications of, of um, the unintentional consequences of this event. You know, they're, they're, they're really in this realm of ideas where they can just, you know, throw out a bunch of stuff. And conservatives are saying, wait, um, how is that going to work compared to what? Um, at what cost, you know, uh, what risk are we mitigating? Like, you know, so much of, of our philosophy and what we look at the issues is uh, saying not so much being the party of no, but rather, you know, let's do this in the most non-intrusive way as possible. And it's a much harder task to, uh, you know. Well, let me, I'm going to push back on you here, Alonzo, and just know that this comes from a registered Republican since the 19... 80 number flipped okay <laughs> so i think that I, was, I was 18 in 1981 the first time i could register to vote right so republicans and and I, when i was your age too and this is not hey listen here young guy right? <laughs> no, no. Well, when, when, I was, when i was 27 in 1990 and and it was it was the reagan bush era you know we republicans all rationalized the increasing national debt because it was worth it to bring down the soviet union Right. So we didn't care how much money we spent on defense. As long as we brought down the Soviet Union, it was worth it at the end of the day. And then we'd go back and fix this. OK. Then we had the Clinton years where Newt Gingrich and Bill Clinton had a little bit of a compromise. They came to an agreement. We started getting some balanced budgets. Taxes were a little higher, but we started balancing some budgets. And for the first time, and I don't remember when was the last time it was done, there was zero debt at the end of a budget year. Then W took over. Those planes hit the tower. And well, it was okay because we had to build up Homeland Security and make sure that those planes didn't come across our oceans again and, and kill people. And it was worth spending more money to create more defense. And again, here, there we were. And when we... And then, and then Trump was the president. Well, we got to cut taxes and get the economy going again. So, we're, you know, we built up that debt more and the deficit. And now that Biden's president, we're all concerned about the debt and the deficit. Why are we concerned? Because a Republican's not president. But we've had a lot of Republican presidents in my lifetime. 
And, and none of them are, are stopping the national debt, the, the debt from increasing. The, the deficit continues. And, and there's a difference between debt and deficit. But the, it just continues. We're at 31 trillion. It didn't come down under Trump's presidency. It, it didn't come down under Bush's presidency. It didn't come down under Reagan's presidency. So at some point along the way, we have to quit blaming this all on the Democrats. We've been a big part of it ourselves. I think it's it's more or less the mentality, though. I I'm mean, sorry that we, went on too long, when, by the way. No, no, it's it's fine because Eisenhower warned us about the military industrial complex, you know, in his last speech. Uh, Reagan, you know, he he didn't deconstruct the administrative state by any means, but he definitely alerted us to it. And when you listen to a time for choosing now in comparison to what's happening today with the same numbers that he's using and you start to do the calculations, it's it's stomach wrenching. And that's why, you know, conservatives need to be on the forefront of saying, hey, maybe we need to revisit some of that aspects of being fiscally conservative again. Um, I think that a lot of the issues that we're seeing with uh, money being pumped into the system is not so much a an, an issue of uh, Republicans being in cahoots with Democrats, but more or less uh, government locking itself and unlocking its bureaucratic agencies to do its policy making. So I, I think that that's been more of a, a detrimental effect with the Federal Reserve being able to just pump out, you know, excessive amounts of money, being able to say, you know, oh, we're going to go down this path of, of QE, right? And Ben Bernanke creating this uh, system where, you know, uh, they're just going to print a bunch of fiat currency, say that we're going to pull it out of the system after we've made all of our investments and, uh, uh, you know, um, lower interest rates to be able to you know have all of this income and spending none of this was done by by any of our senators or our, our congressmen this was all done and and being taken over by the federal reserve you know they they became the, the policy makers for you know how much money is going to be on our system how inflated it's going to be and uh, it's not even their fault it's the fault of our uh, lawmakers that they did not take control of the systems that they've allowed to just run autonomously because of gridlock or or when they do compromise on something you know they've they've shifted too much of the burden into those uh areas so uh, there are i i won't sit here and go down the blame game but but we do need to talk about the the mentalities and the mindsets that are, are in each of our camps whether it's republican or democrat and being a republican is saying that you know there is barriers to our problems right uh, I, I like to tell a story of you know a conservative and a democrat walked into the woods and saw a fence you know the the democrat would say you know uh, we need to remove the fence so we can keep walking but the republican would say you know uh, why is this fence here and maybe we should wait to see you know if this fence should be removed or not you know and that just shows the hesitancy to make you know these broad strokes of policy making that we see our friends on the other side of the aisle try to do so the independent just gets out the wire clippers and goes right through yeah. the <laughs> yeah, they probably do. Yeah. Hey, Alonzo, how do you get tickets for the Lincoln Dinner? So uh, if you go to berkeleycountygop.com, you can go and purchase your Lincoln Dinner tickets. Um, it's going to be a night of fun. we got live music. We're raffling off six different uh, baskets. And... Um, you'll be able to hang out with me. So I don't know if that's... <laughs> I enjoyed that on Friday. Yeah. <laughs> and when is it this year? Um, so it's going to be April 30th. April, April 30th. 30th at 5 p.m. How much are the tickets? Uh, so eighty dollars per person, and then if you want to get a uh, like a prime time seat, sit with one of the lawmakers, that'll be one hundred and twenty five dollars. If you want to get in a sponsorship, uh, sponsorships start at five hundred and end at two thousand five hundred. Very nice, Chris. Nice to meet you. It's nice to meet you guys. Thank you for coming in, Alonzo. I think I'll see you in a couple Fridays. I, I hope to see that. Yeah, very good.